Uncanny Japan is author me, Teresa Matsura, exploring all that is weird from Japan. Strange superstitions and old wives' tales, cultural oddities, and interesting language quirks. These are little treasures I dig up while doing research for my writing, and I want to share them with you here on Uncanny Japan. I hope you like the show. Hey, hey, everyone. How are you this end of the year? Are you feeling pensive, reflective, maybe chomping at the bit for 2020 to hurry up and get here so you can start working on all your New Year's plans and goals? Are you insanely busy because you quit your job and on top of that you need to move and you don't know where your next paycheck is coming from? Yeah, me too. I guess that's a nice segue into how I just realized I'm going to be celebrating my second year anniversary on Patreon in late January. And I'm planning to do a relaunch, making everything super spiffy, offering some new benefits, limited offer campaigns, possibly audio serializing one of my stories from the carp faced boy, and stuff like that. I'll talk more about that next month. For now, though, if you do like the show or you like Japanese bedtime stories, homemade postcards, and recipes, we're all over on Patreon. Just search for Patreon and Uncanny Japan, and we'll pop up. Okay, before I get into today's topic, I wanted to make a quick correction to the last episode about Tsuno Daishi, the great horned master. Remember, I talked about the legend of the fire that destroyed a temple dedicated to Tsuno Daishi, and how during that fire the statue depicting the great horned one flew off and hid in a lake to escape harm? Well, it turns out I got the name of the temple wrong. It's not Jidaiji, but Jin Daiji. So, if you're looking for that, search for Jin Daiji and Tsuno Daiji. Not that other thing I said. And a big thank you to Peter Durfee for catching that. Thank you. Also, my apologies for the podcast being a little later than usual. I wasn't kidding when I mentioned quitting my job and moving. And that's just a crumb of it. I don't think I'd be exaggerating too much if I said that life recently has been insane. The good news is, it looks like in my new abode I'll actually have a kind of cubby to record in, a space all my own, and not just a desk in a one room apartment with blankets strung up on three sides like I do now. Some other pluses no dirt farm, no constant slamming of car doors, and no hungry, sleepy, and or soiled babies crying. So I'm very excited about that. Now on to episode 44. Let me tell you a little story about how I first learned about this wonderfully weird thing. Almost 30 years ago, I went with my mother in law to visit her mother, the family's matriarch, or Hi Oba chan, which means great grandmother in Japanese. She was affectionately called Fumi Ba chan, and you can find her likeness in several of my stories. She's always the good guy. Unlike my mother in law, she was so kind to me, and I adored her. Anyway, on this particular day, I remember sitting on the floor around a low kotatsu table, drinking tea, eating mikan, and listening to my mother in law and Fumi Ba chan chatting about life and stuff. The teapot we were using was really old, and I must have bumped one of the little teacups, and they clinked together or something. My mother in law said, Be careful, you don't want to make it angry or it's going to play a trick on you. My gaping mouth must have asked the question that I couldn't. Because that's when Fumi Ba chan went on to tell me how, in Japan, all objects, once they reach their 100 year birthday, gain a soul. They become alive and a little mischievous, especially if they have been treated badly or tossed out and forgotten by their owner. That's why, my mother in law added, we should always take care of our stuff and treat it well, or it will come back to haunt us. What a brilliant idea! The name of this phenomena is called Tsukumogami. It's been translated in so many different ways. I've seen it written as tool specters, haunted relics, 99 gods, and artifact demons, to name a few. Basically, the idea is just that. On the 100th birthday of an inanimate object, it is granted a spirit or a soul, and it becomes a living thing, capable of playing pranks and causing trouble. While in theory this can happen to any inanimate object, there are a handful of well known Tsukumogamis that you'll run across when you're reading Japanese manga, watching anime, or studying yokai. I could probably do an entire show on just one of them, so I won't get too nitty gritty here. 
I can revisit in more detail some of the more popular ones later. For now, I want to give you the general idea of what artifact demons are. Here are a few of my favorites. The first one I'm going to talk about is called Kasa Obake, or Karakasa. Imagine one of those Japanese old-fashioned lacquered umbrellas. Now, see it 100 years old. The thick washi paper is dirtied and torn. The thin bamboo ribs are snapped and broken. What's really unnerving, though, is that since becoming a Tsukumogami, the thick handle has turned into a single bare leg. A man's leg. Hairy and pretty gross. But that's not all. The Kasa Obake also sports a single big non-lidded eye and a huge lolling tongue. Sometimes you'll find it with arms sticking out from its sides. Kasa Obake, like most Tsukumogami, aren't out to do any real harm. So you'll run across this artifact demon on dark nights, jumping out at you and then hopping around wildly, possibly cackling like a lunatic. No real harm done. If you do run across it, be warned, it might not be alone. The Kasa Obake has a friend that it likes to hang out with. This would be the Chochi Nobake, or Paper Lantern Ghosty. Here, too, you have to picture an old Japanese lantern. Washi paper or silk glued onto thin bamboo ribs. An oil candle burning inside. Because Chochins are so fragile, they tend to break the same way the cloth or silk ripping horizontally between the strips of bamboo. These tears, upon reaching year 100, are what become the mouths. And what can you find protruding from these mouths? You guessed it, a great big tongue. An interesting side note is in some old artwork, the tongue is actually the flame from the candle spilling out. Chochi no Bake also have eyes, either one or two. You'll find them flying about, spooking whoever is around. Next, let's talk about the Itam Momen, or, as I've seen it translated, the one bolt of cotton cloth. Itan means one ton, and a ton measures about 10 meters by 30 centimeters. So an Itam Momen is a very long piece of white cotton cloth that flies and flutters around, causing havoc. Sometimes it surprises people and then zooms away. Other times it might wrap itself around their faces until they suffocate. There are also tales where the Itam Momen envelops some innocent bystander and carries them off, and they're never heard from again. Actually, if you've seen the Japanese anime Gegege no Kitaro, you've probably seen an Itam Momen, as it's one of Kitaro's close friends. Here, however, it's called Rolo Cloth. There are some other tsukumogami that are musical instruments that have reached a ripe old age and have possibly not been well treated or perhaps their master has passed away and they've been forgotten. Two of them are the biwa bokuboku and the koto furunushi. A biwa is a short-necked wooden lute, originally from China. That's what it looks like when it's merely an instrument. When it becomes sentient, however, it looks like an old biwa player, the body of a human, the head of a lute. The eyes are closed because very often, in the days of old, the biwa player was blind. Then you have the koto furunushi. Have you ever seen a Japanese koto? It's that long, low-to-the-ground, stringed instrument. It's plucked with two hands by a very elegant woman in a kimono, kneeling on the floor. Well, when a koto makes the turn, its face becomes that of a demon, and all thirteen broken silk strings stand out all around like wild hair. Pretty cool. Other things that tend to turn into haunted relics are futons, straw sandals, geta, saddles and stirrups, scrolls with sutras written on them, mirrors, prayer beads, kimono, sake jars, a radish grater, and, of course, mosquito nets. If you'd like to look at some old artwork depicting these oddball creatures, I recommend searching for Toriyama Sekien's work. He was a scholar, poet, and ukiyo-e artist who lived from 1712 to 1788. I think the thing he's most well-known for, though, is his Hyaki Yagyo, the Demon Parade Scrolls. 
He gave form to so many of the Japanese yokai and otherworldly creatures. What's relevant here is that his last book was called Hyaki Tsurezure Bukuro, The Illustrated Bag of 100 Random Demons. This was actually a play on words. With all his other books, the kanji for Hyaki was 100 demons. With this last work, though, he changed it to 100 vessels, vessels being all those inanimate objects that make up the Tsukumogami world. So this whole book is filled with haunted relics, most of which are beasties from his own imagination. So there you have it, a brief little description of the Tsukumogami. Here it is, the end of December, and I'm hoping everyone is looking forward to the new year. If you want some old-fashioned Japanese good luck that will last you all through 2020, then go back and listen to Episode 2 of Uncanny Japan. There, I talk about what you need to dream about and why on New Year's Eve to ensure fortune and favor. Hint, eggplant. Also, please note the difference in audio quality from then and now. That has been made possible because of my behind-the-scenes sound tech guy. Thank you, sound tech guy. I also want to thank every single one of you for listening to and supporting the show this past year, with a special huge thanks to my patrons who make all of this and the bedtime stories possible. I'm going to be literally moving on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, but we were able to use some Patreon money to buy us a Christmas present, a new microphone for the show, and two nice lavalier mics for the patrons-only behind-the-curtain segments. So to everyone, sound tech guy and I would like to wish you a happy coming new year. Yoi otoshiyo. And I will talk to you next month. Bye bye. Psst. Hey, do you like scary stories? Or maybe you don't do full on horror, but enjoy a nice dark tale. Something creepy involving Japanese folklore and superstition. Well, if that's the case, you can sneak on over to Amazon or wherever you like to buy books and look for my two short story collections, A Robe of Feathers and The Carp-Faced Boy. All you need to do is search for Teresa Matsura. Let me spell that for you. T-H-E-R-S-A-M-A-T-S-U-U-R-A. Another place you can find me doing things is on Patreon. There, once a month, for my $5 and up patrons, I translate, retail, and record obscure Japanese folk tales. Some are dark, some are humorous, some are just weird. And lastly, another super sweet thing you can do is to write a review on iTunes. By doing this, you help like-minded people find Uncanny Japan. It's a little thing, but it means a lot, and it's a great big help. Thank you, I'm Teresa Matsura, and I'll talk to you soon.